In this video, we're going to learn how to evaluate the performance of time series forecasts. Now, first, I want to clarify what I mean by evaluation, and especially how it is this different from interpretation of forecasting models. Now, so what I mean by evaluation is focusing on the performance of the predictive target variable. That's the label, whatever it is you're trying to forecast. For instance, if you're forecasting sales, then how well did the model forecast the sales numbers? Interpretation, on the other hand, has to do with the importance or the weights of the individual predictor variables. So if in your time series forecasting, you also include amounts of advertising, uh, maybe the weather and so on, and want to see how the, what effects those have on the forecast, that's what I would call interpretation as distinct from evaluation of the forecast model. Now, uh, whereas for managerial purposes, interpretation of the predictors is usually very important. Time series forecasting predominantly focuses only on the accuracy of the predicted uh, target variable, and it pretty much ignores interpretation of predictor variables. Uh, reasons for this include the fact that time series analysis has been traditionally univariate, uh, meaning that it focuses, uh, like in my example, just on the sales numbers and doesn't even consider other factors like advertising and weather or so on, it looks at the passive uh, values and how that affects predictor variables. But then even uh, when um, analysts consider multivariate time series analysis, when they do consider other factors, they, they're usually using other factors to increase the accuracy of their ultimate prediction, and they're not so interested in their analysis on the the effects of the other factors or the exact amounts of the effects of the other factors. So with that clarified, I'm going to focus on evaluating the overall performance of the forecast of the target variable. Now, for any kind of evaluation performance, we need a benchmark. That is, we need something to compare against. And in forecasting, um, we need some sort of default forecast model, a naive benchmark to say that without thinking too hard, here's an estimate we would have. And so how well does your fancy forecasting model do compared to a simple estimate that doesn't require uh, complicated analysis? So we're going to use uh, these two uh, sample data sets to illustrate uh, the perspectives of different default models. Uh, the first is going to be one where there's no seasonality. These numbers are generic. Uh, they re represent uh, quarterly amounts. They could be considered as quarterly sales or quarterly uh, inventory amounts. And first we'll look at when there's no seasonality in the data. And here there's just a general trend. It's not straight up all the time. Sometimes it goes backward, but there's a general upwards uh, progression. So some possible default models here. First, we have um, an estimate that all forecasts are equal to the last observed value. So that is that we're estimating here 2022 values, quarters one to quarter four. And we're saying that all values are equal to the last value that was in, observed in the entire series, which here is 420. And the assumption with this is that there's a trend going on and the next value is either going to keep going up or keep going down. 50, 50 chance it will either go up or down. And that means that just that last estimate is uh, not a bad estimate. And so that's why it goes through 420 and it says 50% chance it'll go higher or below the last trend, 420, 420, and so on. Now this, is, this estimate does not recognize that there is an upward trend here. In some data sets, there's a downward trend. Some data sets, there's no trend. Uh, 
So it just says 50-50, it'll go up or down, and that's the basis of the estimate. Another approach to the default value is saying, well, you know what? There probably is some sort of trend going on, either going up or going down. So to capture that trend, let's not take just the last value, but let's take the an average of the last X values. So it could be the last uh, two, the last four, the last 10 values, and the average kind of captures the average trend in that period. So, uh, and the average could be the mean, the median of the mode of the last X observed values. So for instance, if we decide to kind of capture a trends thing going there, instead of taking just the last value, let's take the last two values and the average of them. So the average of the last two values, 372 and 320 is 396. So with this default forecast, we would say that 2022 first quarter is 396, second quarter 396, 396, 396. So that's what that estimate uh, would, would, would make. Now these uh, default sounds almost kind of silly because they're all based on assuming the past, uh, the past reflects the future, the future will resemble the past. But you would be surprised how hard it is for forecast models to beat these simple defaults. Uh, they're, they're really not that bad as you would think, uh, because assuming there is some sort of trend, these defaults capture something. And they, they actually uh, give forecast models a run for their money to actually beat them. Uh, however, these first two assume there's no seasonality. If you do recognize their seasonality in the data, then that doesn't really work well, as in this second data set, because if you're just taking the last value, well, with the seasonality, that last value is probably going to be far off because it doesn't capture the seasonality. And even if you take the last uh, two values or so on, uh, these two models don't work well. So if you know their seasonality in the data, then uh, two uh, recommended default model approaches are first forecast the uh, a value that's equal to the last observed value at the same point in the seasonal cycle. Okay, that sounds complicated, but it's more easily explained with an illustration. So here we want to estimate uh, 2022 first quarter. Instead of taking the last value as a default, we look at what was the last seasonal value. So what was the last time you had a first quarter estimate? Well, that was 160. That's going to be our estimate for first quarter 2022. Then for second quarter 2022, what was our last second quarter estimate? It's 179. Then for third quarter, the last third quarter was 135. For fourth quarter, the last one is 521. Um, so it just says the last value in the same period last year. Uh, uh, again, you would be amazed how good these simple estimates are, and forecast models have to actually beat them, uh, and they struggle to beat these simple estimates. Another approach uh, to seasonality, if especially with situations where it's not so easy to take the last uh, item in the last period is to look at the size of the period. So here you have a four period season. So uh, every four quarters, the seasonality uh, repeats. Take the average of everything in the last period and use that average number as the estimate for each of the subsequent periods. So in this case, that would mean the last four periods because it's a four period seasonality, four quarter seasonality. You take the average of 160, 179, 135, and 521. That average is 248.75. And you make that the estimate of the four, uh, the four points in the next period. And that's based on the fact that it's kind of like taking the value of the last period, but the actual value 50% of time will be higher than that average. 50% of time will be lower. And so that's a, a simple way to kind of incorporate the seasonality in the averages. And again, it makes fairly decent estimates.
But then uh, once you do have these default models and you are going to compare forecast models, what numbers, what calculations do we actually use? So what we're going to use is actually very, uh, is pretty much the same as what you'd use for standard regression accuracy. The two key measures are root mean squared error, RMSC, and that is mathematically defined as you measure the error. That's the difference between the predicted value and the observed value. You uh, square that error. Uh, you add them all up, you take the average, and you take the square root of that. So RMSC has advantage of being at the same scale as the forecast value. So that's the most widely used measure for forecast uh, accuracy estimation. And another value is the mean absolute error, uh, which in software like RapidMiner is called the absolute error. And there, instead of taking the square and then the square root, you just take the absolute value of the error. So if it's a negative error, you just make everything positive and you take the average of that. So it's the average error uh, and that is a measure of forecast accuracy. Now, to be considered useful, that is if a forecast model is good, then it needs to beat the default model. In other words, if you can just simply say, I'll take the value of the last period, uh, and that's my estimate, well, a good forecast model should, should do better than those uh, simple estimates. And that's how you evaluate forecast models. And if you have multiple forecast models, obviously the one with the lowest error is the best one. Uh, okay. Now, there are some other measures which are widely uh, use for measuring forecast uh, estimation, but which are not necessarily so useful for time series forecasts. Um, the R squared or squared correlation in rapid minor is popular for statistical modeling, especially for uh, linear regression modeling, but it's not really a tool for forecasting. Now, one that is widely used in for forecasting is the mean average percentage error, uh, or sometimes called relative error, and even sometimes called mean average error. And this is, uh, it, it normalizes the sizes of the errors in percentage units, uh, where uh, the, it's 100% means the average size of the target label. And the idea of it is, is supposed to be comparable across data sets, but actually its statistical properties are not very stable and are very inconsistent. And so it's really best to avoid this measure. Uh, if you just stick with RMSC and mean absolute error, those are good measures uh, and they're fairly simple. They're widely available. Those are uh, what I recommend. Now, to uh, analyze the data, it's not enough to just make the estimate and calculate the error relative to the entire data set. There needs to be some sort of validation uh, against training set. However, the most common measure or most common approaches to data validation are split validation or cross validation, but these do not work with uh, time series uh, data sets. And that's because split validation and cross validation uh, both divide the data set into training sets and test sets, but they divide them randomly. They randomly assign each line of data to a training set or test set, and then they compare the performance. Uh, after training the data on the training sets, they they compare the test set performance. Uh, however, this does not work for time series uh, analysis because in time series analysis, the order of rows is crucial. It has a progression of time, but split validation, cross validation, both randomly uh, select rows and scramble the order of rows and that completely destroys the time series. So that does not work at all. Uh, instead, time series uh, validation requires a special kind, which uh, of which the most popular approach is called sliding window validation. 
to show how that works, suppose you have a time series data set, and this is the order of the data. Uh, we could simplify it saying that there's 10 rows of data, but more realistically, let's say there's 100 rows of data, and each of these segments of 10 represents 10% of the data set. Then in sliding window validation, we would say that the training set is 50% of the data. So you're going to train on 50% of the data at any one time. And the test set is 10% of the data. You'll train on 10% of the data at any one time. So in, in this case, uh, with, with that setup, you would have uh, five sliding windows. And that works by the first sliding window. You take the first 50% of the data in order without changing the order. And you train the data on that. Then you use the next 10%, the sixth uh, segment, to test that. Then you slide over to the next 50% from segments two to six. You train on that, and then you, you test on the next 10%. Then you slide over, you train on the next 50%, and so on, until here you reach the end where you're testing on uh, segments five to nine, which is 50% of the data, and you're testing on segment 10, and you can't go further. So you can't, uh, with this approach, you actually never test or train on, uh, on this tense data set. It's only used for testing. And that is a limitation of sliding window validation. You're not able to train on all the data, but you do train on a, a large amount, even most of the data. And most importantly, you retain the time progression of the data throughout. And ultimately, you've tested uh, the data with uh, five different segments. And with that, you can take the average uh, test scores or performance scores. You can even uh, get a standard deviation uh, as you would with cross-validation. And this is a standard way to validate time series analysis data. And so, uh, and so with that, we've seen how to uh, evaluate the performance of and to validate uh, the evaluated performance of time series forecast data.